first off, I would like to introduce Sister Elaine Lin. Elaine is an American-born revert to Islam. She is the Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the Global Studies Center of the University of Pittsburgh and is the Faculty Advisor to the Muslim Students Association, which is how I first got to know her as a student at Pitt. She is also the Executive Director of the Consortium for Educational Resources on Islamic Studies, which is a 31 member consortium of institutions of higher education and community organizations in Western PA in Ohio, housed at the University of Pittsburgh. Elaine and her husband and three ch adult children have been active members of the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh since 1991, and she serves as the board secretary. Next, I would like to introduce Sister Tammy Thompson. During Tammy Thompson's life, she has experienced homelessness, loss, and countless setbacks, but she has used her background to grow, educate, and inspire others. Tammy is an internationally recognized poverty expert. Through her company, T3 Media, a social justice media company, she produced We Wear the Mask, a documentary which was released in 2017, highlighting the stigma associated with women in poverty. She's also the owner of T3 Consulting. Through T3 Consulting, she facilitates and develops home ownership programs for local nonprofit organizations in Pittsburgh. She is a certified housing counselor and she has been teaching and speaking about financial literacy and educating families for 20 years. Currently, Tammy is the executive director of Catapult Greater Pittsburgh. And I would like to introduce our final panelist, Talha Amr. Talha is a UX designer and editor based out of South Southern California. He graduated from Pitt in 2014 with degrees in film and psychology and obtained his master's in human computer interaction and design from UC Irvine in 2017. He currently works at Sourceability Designing, B2B e-commerce e software, but also has interest in urban design and environmentalism. In his spare time, he works on maintaining a Google map of halal restaurants and is a lifelong Steelers fan. So I'm gonna invite my panelists, if they haven't already, to turn on their cameras. There we are. So diversity, it is all the talk right now, but unfortunately, so is tokenism. A token is a minority that is deliberately put on show by a group for the sake of appearing to be culturally diverse. And so my first question to our panel is, what distinguishes tokenism from true diversity? And why is tokenism so prevalent today? I'm not sure who you wanted to go first, but I'll jump in. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for inviting me to participate. I think this is a very important discussion. Um, woo, the difference between uh, true diversity and tokenism. Um, my, my experience has been, um, I think your quote defines it really, really well. There's a difference between inviting people into a space to be an active member of that space and bring their culture and ideals and thoughts and beliefs into a space and just inviting someone in because you need to meet certain quotas or numbers or have a certain perception about your space. Um, and it's really hard to tell which uh, is happening until you're actually in that space. Uh, and then you realize, well, they're not really interested in what I have to say or my belief system or, or you know, who I am as a person. Uh, and, and the reality is, you know, I've had this discussion with other organizations who are working on increasing their quote unquote diversity uh, and inclusion metrics. Um, it's easy to tell uh, when someone's not being intentional about true diversity. So, um, I, you know, I just would advise people to be really thoughtful about how they are making decisions around diversity and inclusion because the people that you're inviting in can tell fairly quickly uh, what the intention is behind that decision. Thank you, Tammy. And I do wanna highlight that you are 
purposefully pairing the word diversity with inclusion, um, which I think is really important. Uh, Elaine and Tulha. I, I would just say that in my experiences, just in my personal experiences, um, I, I know that I need to broaden my uh, diversity and inclusion in, into my own, um, to learn more into my own discourse, whether it be uh, black perspectives, whether it be white conservative perspectives, because I tend to hang out with people who have like minds as me. And so um, whether it's my beliefs, whether it's religion, race, that how do, uh, you know, I'm very much personalizing this right now, but how do I include others into my life without them being the token? Um, I guess it's sincerity in, in approaching them. But I remember one time I was invited to, um, um, amongst a woman's group and religion other than mine, um, and they wanted to have a Muslim perspective. And I just thought it was so like, okay, what does that mean? And, and think of that diversity in the Muslim community. Like my experience would not necessarily be the Muslim experience. And I actually backed out of it because I felt like I was gonna be the token Muslim. Now, was that a, um, a lost engagement? Probably so. But, you know, it, it's, I, I feel like token is a politically charged term, even though people um, come to it with a kind of naive, naivete at times. Yeah, so um, I was going to, oh, assalamu alaikum first, um, but uh, so I was going to say that um, especially uh, within the capitalist framework that, you know, we live in, we have to look at the incentives behind, you know, what the, what these organizations and, and you know, companies and corporations um, are doing. Um, you know, Disney, for example, um, in the past, uh, you know, several years has been moving towards more of, you know, trying to bring more um, diversity uh, in terms of, you know, more African-American stories or more, um, you know, stories focused on women, which, you know, obviously is good, but you also have to understand that the reason why they're doing this is because it's also making them more money because that's what, you know, the their stakeholders are, are you know, being incentivized behind. So if you, if you kind of look uh, behind the mirror a bit, you can, kind of then see if what you know they are actually doing is you know truly because of diversity or they're just token tokenizing it just so that they can you know kind of make more money off of it um yeah thank you elaine and tolha um you all make some really great points grounding us in the capitalistic society that we live in is just a truth um of the world the society that we all uh are in right now. Um, and I appreciate you all talking about your personal experiences with tokenism and with attempted diversity. Um, and so this next question that I have is for Tammy. Tammy, you often talk about how you check off many boxes for folks that are trying to diversify their boards, their staff, their teams. Um, can you talk about can you talk a little bit more specifically about those experiences that you've had and how you've chosen to handle uh, those situations when you're put in them? Yeah, it, this is because it's complicated, right? Uh, because there's this temptation to, from my perspective, there's this temptation to say, hey, you know, no, I'm not going to do that because I am detecting a tinge of tokenism here. And I don't want to be used in that way. There's that temptation. And I know other folks who, who will strongly oppose it. And like Elaine said, in some cases, you, you just say, I don't want to be a part of this. Um, 
but from my perspective, there have been instances where I recognize that there is a certain level of tokenism happening, but I choose to see it as an opportunity to have a platform to expose people to parts of me that they attempted to tokenize. So, you know, speaking of the boxes, you know, I'm a black woman Muslim. So that's like, you know, checking off the boxes. Now I'm getting to the place where I'm an, uh, a middle-aged black woman tokenism, you know. So what I've chosen to do in a lot of cases, unless it's just very blatant, and I don't believe that people really want to learn more about my perspective and to utilize the talents and the skills that I know that I bring to the table. Um, I see it as an opportunity to get into a space and bring these very intentional perspectives to, because you don't know, maybe people came in it with the wrong um, idea, but there's a way to change that sometimes. There's a way once you get to the table to that they can recognize, oh, this was a really good decision to bring them in. This is a good decision. This is gonna benefit our mission. This is gonna bring value to what it is that we're trying to do. Um, so, you know, I recognize, you know, and it might just be, you know, a certain level of cynicism that has grown in me as I uh, continue to try to navigate being a citizen of this country that, um, there are a lot of systems and, and you know, things that have made this country what it is, which means it makes the sectors of the country that we participate in what it is. And um, I think it's important for us to have these seats at the table. It's important not just for us or not just for these organizations or corporations that bring us in be for the wrong reasons. It's important for the people that we represent to show up and, and bring our true selves, because that's the other issue. You know, it, it doesn't help our cause if we show up and attempt to acclimate to these spaces. It's really important that we show up as our true selves so that people get the true versions of us that are going to benefit others um, who, who we represent. So, you know, showing up as my true self in all of these spaces as a Black female Muslim is important to me um, because these are, these are not costumes. These are, you know, pieces of who I am. And I, and I just think it's important that we recognize that tokenism is going to exist. We have to recognize that this diversity inclusion is a trend in this country right now. And it does benefit capitalism and it does benefit lots of other things that we can uh, identify as negative. But we have to go into these spaces prepared to represent the spaces prepared to represent the people that, um, you know, that we feel connected to in a positive way um, so that we can hopefully, uh, you know, as we continue to do this, we can upset these negative narratives around what has kept us out of these spaces organically in the first place. So, you know, I choose to use those opportunities to do good uh, as a representation of, of you know, a black female Muslim. Thank you, Tammy. And you're right. If if you spoke earlier about how diversity and inclusion go hand in hand for it to be true diversity. And when you don't have inclusion, that's when you're forced to assimilate, right? That's when you're, you force the people that you're bringing on, you're bringing them on with the expectation that you will assimilate. Um, and Elaine, you spoke earlier about how important it is for you to recognize that you don't you don't represent all of Muslims or all women or all whatever um, when you're asked to speak on a panel or to be a part of a team. And you yourself, you're a white convert, which ironically in Muslim spaces makes you a minority um, in those specific spaces, right? And so I'm curious also about what have your experiences with tokenism been like in these spaces? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, it has, um, the eyes light up um, 
when uh, in the when I was younger, I have to say it's it's waning a little bit now that I'm older, but eyes used to light up in the mosque when um, when I would appear as a white convert. Now I want to say something that when we say white, you know, 48% of Muslims identify as white. And 25% of Muslims in America identify as Asian American and 25% Black American. So what is white? Meaning, okay, white blue eyes, like even one notch up from being an Arab American, you know, that I'm this Northern European descent American, which is even more of a icing on the cake, which is colonial past, I think a heritage of our colonial past um, and our current, our history in America. But I'm also in a minority, uh, I mean, so I'm a majority there in my whiteness, but um, I'm a convert. And there's one in five Americans are a convert. So this kind of double, um, uh, it, double being Northern European descent and a convert. Um, it has been uh, um, challenging at times, but it has also been able, I'm able to, um, to expand outside of the, the mosque and through my work with the consortium, I'm able to present Islam and say things that on panels that many times immigrant, immigrant community members um, and I'm not going to say Black Americans, I'm going to say immigrants, would be fearful to say because the, the consortium started in a post 9-11 world. And, and so being able to bridge that has been a gift, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, that I could serve that role. Um, but the other thing I was going to say about just being a token in our mosque you know, reflect, reflecting on our diversity in the workplace is important, but reflecting on our diversity within the mosque is even, is equally critical. Because if we do not learn and relearn and value each one of our um, parishioners that come into the masjid, it, it will, Islam will, will fail in our country because this is what the uniqueness of our country um, and the, the diversity in our country and even hyper-diversity in the masjid. But if we can't you know, think of the benefits, um, the innovate, the, the, not the innovation, God forbid that word come in with Islam, but you know, the, the idea that, that we can capitalize on our diversity then we can transfer all this out to the workplace. So we have to we have to really focus and young people who are at the here on on participants, please bring these attitudes to the masjid. Don't don't stay away from the masjid. Bring it to the masjid because the young forty percent of the uh, Muslims are under um, uh, forty percent are under thirty years old. So you are our future and you're coming with these attitudes. We need you in the mosque thinking about this as well as in the workplace. Sorry, I had to. <laughs> I totally hear you. And that that's an, a topic for an entire conference. And right. You know, yes, it is. Um, and we'll touch a little bit about uh, how to be the concept of welcoming in the religious atmosphere in our how to be an effective ally session later. Right. Here conference. Um, but Elaine, thank you for breaking down the concept of what white means right now for us, right? Um, we're talking about race and race is a, is a social construct. We all know that. Um, but I also say like it, the, the race that is white is so diverse. Um, 
I am an Egyptian woman and North Africans are categorized as racially white by the United States of America. It's in our census, it's in the, every form that we fill out. They tell you, oh, if you are from this country or if you are ethnically this, then racially you are X, Y, and Z. And so it is something that we are told, right? It's not political. necessarily, yes, it's not necessarily self uh, a self-identity kind of thing. So there is a bit of a tension there as well. Um, but focusing a little bit more about that, your experience as a, as a white person, um, you're, you, in the outside, outside of the, the world of Muslim spaces, you also navigate the world as a white woman. Um, how have those, have, how have your intersectional identities of white skin color within and out and outside of the Muslim spaces affected your experiences specifically in the workplace? Um, I would say my workplace is um, somewhat unique in that um, as a, um, as a Muslim woman, um, I, I am the token. Um, I, it is viewed, um, your, your level of religiosity is um, viewed with skepticism, I would say, in, the, in academia. The more religious you are or display your religiosity, the kind of um, lack of credibility that you haven't taken the scientific approach to, um, to faith. And this happens to um, people of faith, of all faiths. So um, it has been interesting to then demonstrate, and you know, obviously it's not obvious that I am a Muslim because I don't wear hijab, but I've been worked at this place long enough that people know I'm a Muslim and I've tried to be outspoken at times um, or an advocate when um, needed to be. Um, I do need to speak up more and I, I wanna bring that up more, like how can, um, how can we, how can I be a spokesperson for Islam, you know, during, in terms of religious holidays, in terms of um, uh, gifts that people are given, these very kind of trivial kind of things, but they start weighing on you. They chip away at, a, at an institution that considers itself very woke, <laughs> but they're realizing they're not you know, really they are, um, and they're working on it. My institution, University of Pittsburgh, really is working on it. And, and the Muslims Alumni Association is just, you know, that is a welcome uh, benefit to them. But, but I would say more my tokenism is a level of, um, or how you're viewed as your kind of level of religiosity. And that times, that can be thought of, um, as not intellectually, um, um, you know, rational in an academic setting. And I'm not sure if that is it in other workplaces. Thank you so much, yeah. Arlene. Um, Talha, turning now to you, um, there's a lot of conversation about the biases that our technologies bring because of who they are designed by, uh, built for, tested on. Um, so taking into consideration your experience as a UX designer, uh, are there ways that the products that we build today, that, is there a way to make them more inclusive for different people and diff people of different identities? Yeah. Um, so before I uh, kind of answer the question, um, I do, yeah, I want, want to bring up that, um, yeah, it, it, these technologies um, that everyone uses, um, you know, whether it's all the different apps on your phone, you know, social media, um, different platforms and, um, you know, different in technology infrastructures, a vast majority of them are built by uh, white hetero male uh you know, males in based out of Silicon Valley in liberal California. So that is obviously going to be coming with a set of its own biases. Um, now, ways to kind of um, combat uh, uh, combat this to um, 
to make sure that technology is not just accelerating what is already you know built in the system, but can bring in um, other uh, other voices. Um, there there are several ways um, that uh, that you can mitigate this. Um, so, for example, um, one way is to um, uh, you know since these algorithms are are built on uh, on established data sets by including other um, you know like for example. Um, you know, there have been studies shown that, uh, like, uh, delivery uh, systems like Amazon or whatever, they uh, it, it may take five minutes for it to get from you know uh, uh, from the distribution center to a a uh, a white privileged uh, community, but that same service will take you know maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes in a African American one. Um, so. And, and a lot of these things again are built on these algorithms. So if you take that data, those data sets, and include, uh, and not only include but weight, bring more weightage to some of these other um, uh, other voices, that then uh, ends up balancing out the algorithm a little bit. Um, other things that that uh, can be done are um, having more transparency behind. Um, what what these algorithms are doing to the public, so that they have uh, more knowledge as to you know what's going on, and to also audit those um, audit those technologies. Uh, the companies themselves can have their own uh, internal policy changes. Um, you know, uh, not necessarily meaning you know hiring people just for the sake of it, but to actually listen to what they are um, to what they are saying. Um, and then obviously there are various uh, uh, design opportunities as well. Um, you know, as a UX designer, um, one of my main um, uh, you know concerns is to advocate for the user. And um, a lot of times, uh, technology can be very ableist, and uh, you don't take into consideration people who might be colorblind or. Um, uh, you know, or who have uh, uh, like haptic touch, um, you know, disabilities. So uh, designing to make sure that, you know, our technology can be used by by everyone, you know, for example, like Microsoft, um, they did a they did a really good job of um, designing video game controllers um, that, uh, you know, uh, like deaf and blind uh, community uh, could use. And, you know, that, that that's amazing, you know. Um, so to uh, you know that that's uh, another way um, that you can kind of mitigate um, some of what is already uh, inbuilt in our system. Thank you so much, Tolha. I think that really demonstrates how diversity of experience um, is truly uh, vital to um, build products for everyone and not just the few. Um, I want to move us into a situation, like to responding into a situational scenario. And so I'm going to invite um, Rachel to go ahead and start sharing her screen once more so that the audience can read along with me. Um, here's the scenario A woman named Jamila applies for a client facing position at your company in a conservative town. She wears hijab management voices concerns about the clientele's reception to your company if Jamila was to be representing it. So I think that there are a couple different ways for us to start talking about this scenario. Um, one, let's talk about who, who is hearing um, the, uh, this conversation about management's uh, concerns. Is this a person that is a part of the hiring committee and is a part of upper management? Or is this a person who is lower or middle management and has just overheard um, the company's concerns through the grapevine, which we all know happens all the time? Um, so I'm, I would like to invite thoughts from the three of you responding to this scenario. Um, and in each case, kind of tell us a little bit about what you think about whether uh, the situation, whether this person has uh, the ability to influence culture versus if they do not. 
I would love, I, I'm so happy that this is the scenario. Um, this actually happened to me <laughs> uh, a little differently, but it, but it happened. Um, I, similar to Elaine, I'm a convert. I was not born into Islam. Um, I converted about six years ago now. Uh, and at the time I was um, working as a consultant for a Presbyterian church. And um, I was facilitating uh, a model, uh, anti-poverty programming. And um, I was going through my conversion as I was doing this work. And one day I showed up in a hijab. And um, you would think that I showed up with four uh, AR-15s. <laughs> they were mortified. Um, and they actually uh, pulled me into a meeting and told me that they were concerned um, about what was happening. And um, they didn't know if it was the right, uh, since I was very forward facing in the programming, they didn't know if it was the right um, messaging considering that they were a Presbyterian church. And I was stunned. Um, I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. I was angry. I was hurt. I, I had worked with these people uh, for years and um, I didn't know what to do. I really didn't know what to do. Um, it was a very awkward situation. It damaged the relationship. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't know if they even recognized that they had put themselves in a very vulnerable situation because I could have sued them. Um, for their behavior, but I didn't. Um, we we talked it through. Um, you know, obviously I still wear my hijab, uh, but it was it was very damaging to the relationship. It was damaging to how I saw them as an organization moving forward. Um, and um, I know that this probably happens every single day. Um, and you know, in this particular scenario. Um, I think it's important for people to recognize the legal ramifications. Uh, if you're running an organization, there's some very severe legal ramifications uh, for this. Um, so yeah, I don't, I'm interested to hear what everybody else has to say because uh, it, it is a very difficult place. Uh, if I, Jamila, you know, if I were Jamila, it, it's very heartbreaking um, to be told that your faith uh, you know, a, a part of who you are as a person um, could be damaging to a business. Um, it's, it's, it's a horrible thing to hear. So I'm very curious to hear how the rest of the panelists would address this. Well, this is a, a um, armchair, you know, uh, reflection on this. I'm not an expert on this at all, but going back to the legal ramifications, one of the things that I put in the resources is the Council of American Islamic Relations, which we're all familiar with, has a know your rights as a, an employee um, uh, guidebook. And I would recommend that um, we all get somewhat familiar with it, knowing that it's a, a reference there. And they have a, a quite a long list of useful references. Um, I would say as upper management, um, if I was a senior management, I would probably be approaching it as to um, uh, why we think it's a benefit to the company. And if it is a, a, a business, it, uh, number one, it's, it's about profits right? If we go beyond the legal ramifications. So why do we think if she's a client facing, I would probably approach it. Number one is um, uh, that it behooves us. It's in our best interest to uh, consider the diversity of the population that we interface with and provide some data on that information. Um, kind of building on Jamila, I mean, on Tammy's situation, going to a religious organization, working at a religious organization with a hijab, I would probably try to, um, what, what 
what do we have in common? We, you know, the, the hijab, the hijab is the hijab. We all know the issues around the hijab. Um, but what do we have in common? What does Jamila bring to that company that is um, in addition to her diversity as a hijab wearing woman, right? What is the what are the talents she brings to it? What what do we have in common with Tammy? You know, she was a religious woman observing, you know, observant to God's principles, as are the Presbyterians. You know, we have different ways to approach this. But I think that kind of those things, looking at the demographics of who are who your my company serves, um, looking at what does Jamila bring to it. In addition to the hijab and the diversity, those would be things that I would um, highlight. That's an upper management. Yeah, um, I definitely want to uh, piggyback off of what Elaine said about how important it is, um, not for not only for um, uh, you know you joining um, uh, you know another company, but if you are also within um, you know that that organization um to definitely know your rights um because you know not just only on a on a federal level but also state city county um because you know they they vary um and and knowing these rights you know they uh they they can empower you um not only that but um you know knowing that you know hr you know human resources a, a lot of uh a lot of people come into it thinking that HR is kind of meant to help you when in reality, they're just kind of there um, for, for the company's sake to, to kind of mitigate different situations. Um, but if you, if you kind of change your framework uh, into, um, into understanding that, you can kind of use that as a benefit to then you know, ad try and advocate for yourself. Um, because yeah, you know there are legal ramifications if you are denied, you know different um, different resources or or whatnot based on you know, your ethnicity, gender, or you know wh whatever it is. Um, yeah, I just want to throw that out there. Thank you. And this, uh, we're actually getting a question from uh, an audience member. Zaid is saying. Um, from a corporate perspective, companies and organizations are doing a great job in inclusion, meaning that they're hiring the required check boxes. Um, however, I feel that when you go up the corporate ladder, you will see far less diversity and inclusion. So again, talking about that upper management that you, you are all referencing. There needs to be a discussion around diversity of thought and inclusion of thought in the US corporate structure to make a true impact within the context of diversity and inclusion. Would love the panelists thoughts on that. Is there anything you guys wanna add to what, what was just said to address this question? Yeah, I kind of um, disagree. <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think it's the opposite. I think a lot of companies, corporations, organizations are doing a good job at diversity, uh, but not such a good job at inclusion. Inclusion is very, very different than diversity. Inclusion is exactly what we talked about when we started this discussion. It is the intentional uh, inviting in to uh, value different thoughts, cultures, and beliefs. And the reality is, is most corporations are not doing a good job of inclusion. Uh, they are checking off their diversity box because they have to. Um, but there, there's a lot more to inclusion than hiring someone. Uh, you know, take, it, inclusion means you're going an extra step to make sure that the people that you're hiring to check off your diversity box are being intentionally included in their thought value, that you are being intentional about making sure that they are feeling included in, uh, you know, that they are a, a, an included member of the organization and the culture of the organization. Um, I actually have a lot of discussions with my Black comrades who, uh, we actually cringe when we see DNI. Honestly, I'll just be honest. I really cringe because 
and hiring people for the sake of hiring people actually does them more harm than good. Being invited into a space where you don't feel welcome, being invited into a space where your talents and skills will not be utilized to their full potential because you're just there um, and no one really values that talent and skill that you bring is worse than not being invited in in the first place. So I do uh, see a lot more diversity um, uh, you know, attempts, but I, I, I would love to see more true inclusional attempts happening in, in these workplaces. So I also want to bring in another question um, it, that someone added, which is, as an employee that might not have a seat at the table during these discussions, how can we go about turning existing tokenism into, in our workplaces, into true diversity initiatives? So now we're moving to kind of um, the solutions. What are the recommendations that you have for folks and what they can do? Um, one one quick thing, um, I, I think it answers uh, uh, that question, and I, I also want to piggyback of piggyback off of what Tammy said was. Um, so obviously there are uh, ways that um, these organizations can try and structurally um, uh, come to try and um, you know change change the culture. Um, for example, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a diehard Steelers fan. And um, you know, historically in the NFL, um, there have been lots of issues about adding. You know, that they are trying to add you know diversity, but not so much inclusion within um, you know the the upper rankings. Um, not only with head coaches, but other um, you know within the NFL organization. Um, and you know, uh, specifically with the Steelers, uh, it was through them that um, uh, the you know, the owners they added something called the Rooney Rule which is that you have to uh, uh, um, interview uh, at least one minority candidate um, for, for a coaching position, which is fine. But then what I really admire what the Steelers did is that, you know, when they hired Mike Tomlin, an African-American coach, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily the, just because he was, he was black, but because of all the skills that he brought in, you know, uh, specifically as a defensive coordinator and his strengths as, uh, you know, uh, the, the different skills he brought in and they let him flourish with that and that they gave him tons of resources to focus on what his, what his strengths were on. And through there, he himself has become an advocate for all of his other, um, you know, coaches and, and players. And he has elevated himself to be, you know, uh, that, to put himself in that platform. Um, that was also helped with, you know, the, the Steelers organization itself. Other teams have tried doing it, but it has not come to the same level of success because they haven't, you know, they, they brought in that diversity, but they didn't include them and, and give them, um, you know, uh, the, the power, um, you could say. Thank you, Talha. And you actually addressed another one of the questions that came in, which is what, what organizations are doing it well? Um, and so I actually, uh, we're running uh, low on time and I wanna move us to wrap up this discussion by asking you one more question, which is um, how do we know if our workplaces are becoming more diverse and inclusive? Has it ever happened? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to, because this is a pit based organization, I'm going to, um, I will praise Pitt for what it's doing. That they, um, you know, we are creating um, a Muslim um, uh, affinity group amongst staff and faculty to be able to have our. Um, voices heard to be a support for when um, uh, they're recruiting uh, faculty and staff um, to be an advocate for when our students um, feel um, um, discriminated against. It's something, it's, it's, it's not easy to create, but we have created this um, um, or uh, 
community, community and Pitt is doing whatever it can to support us. So that is something I know they're doing it um, with uh, gender focus organizations, with Latinx organizations, um, the uh, African American has um, uh, colleagues have a strong um, organization there. So they're doing a lot. I feel as though we need to advocate more, but advocacy comes with when there's strength. So now that we have this organization, like I am so tired of so having to celebrate Christmas. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to acknowledge it anymore. Even the nationality room, something that we prize so much, you know, it, it's always focused around the Christmas holidays when we're, so I think with, um, Pitt is trying to do some, to do a lot. And um, I, I think alumni need to be, nothing gets Pitt going more with their alumni aren't happy that, you know, so be, be thinking about it, be aware, be sensitive to thinking about when you were a student, as well as, um, you know, engaging with the organization as well. So um, that's what I'm gonna say about my class. Tammy and Zola, any quick final thoughts on that? I, I just want, I just really, you know, and, and I get it. This diversity and include is difficult. It is hard because everything that we do in this country is based on a white supremacist ideal, right? So anything that you do outside of that, it's hard for people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've we've internalized it, even as a Black woman, you know, and I've spoken to other uh, Black folks, we have internalized this, these white supremacist ideas to the point that anything outside of the white standard is, uh, and that includes religion, right? Anything outside, I can't tell you the number of people who ask me where I'm from. I'm from Bluefield, West Virginia. <laughs> I live in Pittsburgh. I've, you know, I, like it's almost impossible for people to believe that anything outside of that white standard is American. And that has spring, that sprinkles throughout all of our institutions and all of our, you know, everything. So what for me, what's going to be when you start to recognize when you go into places and it's not a shock to see someone other than uh, you know, a white hetero person, uh, you know, leading something or, you know, the face of something and people don't give pause to it, then I'll feel like we've made some progress. When you go into an organization and there's representation of the, the vast differences that we have and it's not, um, you know, not even celebrated. It should just be, it should just be. And, um, you know, even, all of us, all of us have to do that work, all of us, because even us sitting here, we know that we've been discriminated against for all of our differences, but we also have to make sure that if we're, you know, I'm, I'm the director of a nonprofit, I have to be intentional about making sure that I am not uh, so insular that I'm not recognizing if I'm doing it. Right. So I just think that we all have to every single day, we have to be really, really intentional about defining what diversity means for us. What does it mean? Uh, defining what inclusion means and then being intentional about it every single day. I, I think once we do that, then we'll know that that this is really working. And right now, just honestly, I just don't think it is. Yeah, I think that when we know that we've made some kind of progress is that when um, when the normalization of the other, you know, occurs without getting to the point of it becoming pander pandering to assimilation. Nice. Succinctly put, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, we didn't get to all the questions. And so I just wanna tell the audience that if you still have, if you heard something today that you want to, you want to explore with one of our speakers, uh, we do have the fireside chat that is scheduled for Sunday. And if you haven't already uh, signed up for a fireside chat, or if you want to change who you've signed up for, um, please email uh, 
our team. Um, one of our team members is going to drop the email right now in the chat for you for who you can email with that information. Um, but then to close up, I just want to also let everyone know that uh, another one of the questions that came through at, was asking for direct resources. And we have a quick tips document, a little booklet that we are going to send out to everyone um, right after the conference is over. So look for it, I think maybe Monday, I don't think we'll do it on Sunday, but Monday we will send out a booklet of resources for you to begin. This is by no means an all-inclusive set of resources, but if you just wanna know where to begin or if you wanna follow up on some of the tips that our panelists sh share today, uh, we hope that this booklet can, can serve that purpose. Um, and I also wanted to share a personal reflection question with you all, which is I want to point out the resources that we all have at our fingertips. We all have time in some way, shape or form, or maybe I shouldn't say we all have time, money, voice networks. We all have a combination of one or more of the above. Looking at what you have personally, how can you contribute to the topic at hand? How can you aid in diversity in the workplace with your voice, your time, your network, or your money? Um, given what the panelists spoke about today and given what maybe you'll read up and follow up on with the quick, uh, the quick tips packet that we'll be sending out to everyone. I wanna say thank you so much to our amazing panelists, Tammy, Elaine, and Tulha. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. I wish we had another hour to keep going. Um, and I wanna say thank you so much to the audience.